I bet many of you have a smartphone with you today. How many applications on your phone do you think rely on satellite technology? Well, I counted mine on my phone this morning. It's about 35. When you start thinking in those terms, you start realizing that satellites are used for virtually everything you can imagine. Satellites bring us all sorts of services. They bring us live sporting coverage, global news coverage. They tell our cars where to drive with GPS. They drive critical services, such as financial transactions, Earth observation, even planetary exploration. They gather important scientific data. They can make our lives hum with progress and possibility. However, there is an irony to all of this connectivity. And that's that a lot of what we know about our environment on planet Earth, whether this be disappearing rainforests, melting ice caps, plastic in our oceans, actually comes from satellites. And these satellites themselves have become polluters in space. Since the 1950s, we've been launching them up there in a justifiable race for progress. However, 60 years later, it's finally catching up with us. The first satellite, Sputnik, was launched in 1957. Since then, there have been 6,000 satellites launched into space. That's approximately 80 to 120 satellites every single year. There are now almost 7,000 tons, yes, that's right, 7 million kilograms of space junk up there right now. Of the 40,000 objects tracked by the US Space Surveillance Network, only 1,200 of them are actually operational. The rest is just space debris hurtling by at speeds of 18,000 miles per hour. That's 10 times faster than a bullet. Put this in Hollywood terms, and Houston, we've got a problem. Space junk has the potential to cause real catastrophic damage. If satellites collide in space, they could potentially prevent access to all those services I just talked about. I'm guessing some of you might have seen the film Gravity. Well, in the film Gravity, uh, right at the beginning, a whole bunch of space junk comes along and destroys their space shuttle, effectively. How realistic is this? Well, you might be surprised. This, as many of you might know, is the International Space Station. It cost $160 billion to build. It is the single most expensive item humankind have ever produced. On a frequent basis, the ISS receive com receives commands from the ground to actually move out of the way of space junk. However, for certain situations, it can't move out of the way quickly enough. And these are classed as space debris emergencies. In such a situation, the astronauts have to evacuate to their Soyuz capsule and prepare to get off the ISS. Now, this critical event has already happened three times in the life of the ISS. This here is a photo tweeted by Tim Peake, our British astronaut. In it, the caption that comes with it is, this is a chip in one of our cupola windows. Glad it's quadruple glazed. Just shows how risky all this flying debris is to the International Space Station. Either it has to be resilient enough to withstand an impact, or it has to be swift enough to actually get out of the way of this space junk. According to ESA calculations, it doesn't take a whole lot to produce a real problem in space. An object just one centimeter in size, that's the width of your index finger, could disable a critical satellite subsystem. An object slightly larger than one centimeter could penetrate the shields of the ISS. And something about 10 centimeters 10 centimeters in size, could shatter a spacecraft into pieces. Imagine being up there on the ISS, hundreds of kilometers above Earth, and navigating a field of unruly projectiles. It's like B-52 
been on the M25, but <laughs> with no road markings, no signs, no directions, and cars going in every direction you can imagine. Complete chaos. So, to put it shortly, if we don't start clearing up this orbital mess, we're inviting catastrophe. We're putting all sorts of human progress in jeopardy. I want to tell you a bit more about space junk, but to do that, we need to know a bit more about how space works. Space, as I'm sure you've heard, is absolutely massive, but we can't just put satellites anywhere. Satellites have to go in very specific orbits based on the functionality. You have Earth observation satellites, navigation ones. There's a region up to 2,000 kilometers above Earth, and that's known as LEO, or Low Earth Orbit. Now, in this region, everything suffers from drag. And so bit by bit, all of your satellites will come back down to Earth, where they'll eventually burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. But those items which are much lower, set 200 kilometers, suffer much more drag, and therefore will come down within weeks or even days. But those that are 1,000 kilometers, much higher up, it can be hundreds to thousands of years before such an object comes down. Now, you can imagine, if such an object failed in space at such a high altitude, it would just remain floating about as space junk. However, space junk isn't just all of these defunct and broken satellites up there. It consists of all sorts of things. Every time you launch something, the launch rings that break off, these go into space. Space is full of millions of fragments of metal, glass, plastic, all over the place. If you can imagine all of these projectiles everywhere you look. One of the worst accidents that happened in space was in 2009. The US Iridium-33 satellite, which is the one that provides uh, satellite phone services, that collided with a Russian defunct Cosmos 2251 satellite. And they basically hit each other at 12 kilometers a second, completely obliterating them into just fragments. In fact, satellites that get old also have residual fuels on them, and sometimes these fuels mix, so satellites are remarkably good at exploding by themselves. However, let's get on to what could really go wrong. This is known as the Kessler syndrome. Now, Don Kessler was an astrophysicist and scientist at NASA, and he theorized in the 70s that as space junk collides, it produces more space junk, and that produces even more space junk. So you end up with this cascading effect that has the ability to wipe out entire orbits of satellites. He first published this in a landmark paper in 1978, which actually led to the formation of NASA's Space Debris Program Office for the first time. Imagine being in the Caribbean if we had lost access to all of these satellite services. It's hurricane season, and you're tracking a hurricane. Suddenly, all the information you have, how strong is it? Where is it going to hit? Where is it going to pass over? All of this information suddenly disappears. Is this just a fantasy? No, this is a real potential scenario. However, we can start to fix this. There are really two solutions. Either we ensure things we launch into space have the ability to come back down themselves, and or we launch missions up there to actually capture some of this space drunk and bring it back down to Earth, where it will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. So a lot of satellites in space, they take care of their own demise, and they do that by actually thrusting themselves lower and lower until they burn up. But of course, if they don't have a propulsion system, or if they uh, are broken, this, this isn't a real option, which gives the litter pickers of space even more urgency. 
This here is a drag cell. Now, a drag cell is about three by three meters, and it's made of mylar or kapton, which are just materials only micrometers thick. Now, how does this work? Well, you can imagine on Earth, you have a plane that comes into land, it puts up its flaps, and it does this to produce more drag. Now, the same concept applies to this sail in space. Little particles hit it, and that slows your satellite down. So I mentioned there's a second solution, and that's active debris removal. That's the concept of sending things up there to rendezvous with, capture, and then pull back down to Earth, uh, the actual space junk. So since the 1970s, possibly even earlier, this problem has been known about. But it's only been in the last five or so years that real missions have been conceived to actually deal with this problem. This here is the Remove Debris mission. It's a consortium of 10 partners run by the Surrey Space Center, University of Surrey. And basically, it has a net, a harpoon, and a drag sail I mentioned on board. And the concept is it's going to go up there. It's going to eject small little satellites that will be used as artificial space junk. This here is the net. The net's designed to capture one target. And it's been tested in all sorts of things, such as a drop tower and also a parabolic flight. Now, the parabolic flight is something that flies really high and it drops suddenly. It simulates zero G. And this is what astronauts use to actually train. So this net's also been tested in such an environment. Now, of course, we have harpoons, we have nets. These all seem like sim sim well, simple concepts, and they are. They've been used for thousands of years underwater to you know, capture things such as sea creatures. However, taking technologies that are mature on Earth, in the oceans, and actually bringing them up there into space and seeing, will these concepts work for the first time? Nobody has ever used a net or a harpoon for these purposes in space before. This here is a European Space Agency mission. That's a picture of a satellite called Envisat. Now, Envisat was launched many years ago, but in 2012 became defunct. It, it basically died. And it's, this satellite is 8,000 kilograms, or 8 tons. It's also 26 by 10 meters. You can see the size of the person there. And, uh, and that's not even the full spacecraft. That's without the big solar panel that gets deployed. This is the largest piece of space junk up there in space. You can imagine how phenomenal the size of it is. European space agencies are going to launch a mission, hopefully, in 2024, to actually start to deal with this problem and consider, could this piece of space junk actually be cleaned up? So we know now there's a lot of space junk up there. We know that it has the potential to cause catastrophic damage. And in fact, there have been collisions, as I mentioned. And we know that there are some solutions in the pipeline. But one of the core questions is, who is responsible for all of this? Who's responsible for keeping space tidy? Well, there's space law is complicated. Every single item in space, whether it be a full satellite or a piece of glass, it's actually owned by somebody. You can't take away their property without their permission. Besides, if a tiny little fragment hit your satellite, you wouldn't even know who did it. These fragments are so small, we can't even track them from the ground. There are some new space laws. One such law says that new satellites that are launched should actually come back down to Earth within 25 years, which is a very good step. Unfortunately, it doesn't deal with all the space junk up there, and not all countries have actually ratified this individual law. It'd be common sense to say that either governments or companies that were responsible for actually putting all this junk up there to begin with should be the ones to tidy it up. It's really not that simple, though. Most of these satellites were deposited there between the 60s and the 80s in the space race. In fact, 
governments now, as I'm sure you're aware, have to balance budgets. And there's so many different things that money needs to be spent on. This is just one of the items that needs consideration. One thing that's really going to push this area into the spotlight is the rise of something known as mega constellations. Mega constellations are satellites that are launched into space in groups ranging from between hundreds to thousands of satellites. And it's proposed in the next few years this type of, these type of launches could actually start happening. Now, given that there's only 6,000 satellites in space right now or that are fully operational, you consider now how many satellite launches that are going to be for these mega constellations. Even if a small percentage of these fail, the question is, who's going to finance their removal? Who is responsible for cleaning these things up? I guess it's, it's good that a lot of these serious questions are now being considered in the right circles. We can no longer just keep thinking of our environment as just the planet Earth. In 60 short but productive years, we've filled all of our neighboring space with junk. This is no different than just dumping industrial waste in the ocean. The space junk is a global issue. It needs treating in a similar way to that of climate change. It requires governments, industry, academia, cross collaborations between everyone to actually start to solve this problem. Space junk is a real issue. And if we don't start solving this, the potential for disaster could be immense. Can you imagine if services got cut off to the billions of people that currently use all of these different range of things that satellites provide? In the worst possible case, it could be too dangerous to leave, leave the Earth's atmosphere putting on hold things such as space exploration or even aspirations of becoming a multi-planet species. The potential for disruption is almost unimaginable. Thank you.